Hi. So in Dutch we have a saying which goes, a good begin is het halve werk. And this translates into English as, well begun is half done, or a good start is half the battle. Now unfortunately in music production and in Cubase that's not literally true. Even when you start well, there's still lots to do to finish a song, a soundtrack or whatever you're working on. But there are definitely a couple of things which you better get right when you start a new project in Cubase. Because they're quite hard or annoying to change later on. So let's have a look at setting up a project in Cubase and let's go. So let's immediately have a look at how you create a project in Cubase. And that usually starts with the Cubase hub, which I'm showing here. And I've done a separate video on the Cubase hub already, which I'll link at the end of this one, so you can check it out. And I'll not go into the details of all of this again, but basically there are two ways to create a project, and that's from scratch, in which case you push create empty over here. Then in the way I've set up the Cubase hub, it prompts for a project location. So let's do Cubase data test here, and I have a new project. And the settings for this project that it now created can be found under project, project setup. And over here you can see a number of settings which we'll take a look at in more detail in a minute. And basically the settings that you see over here are taken from the last configuration that you used in your projects. Which makes sense of course because if you set this up previously for a project, a lot of the times it's quite logical that your next project will have the same kind of settings. Now there's another way to create a new project. So if we go to file, create new project, Again, you get the Cubase hub and you can now also select templates over here. So for example, let's select one of my mastering templates. And if I now push create, again, I need to select the project folder. Let's activate the project as well. And if we now take a look at the project setup, then the settings that you see over here are taken from the project template, which also makes complete sense, of course, if you create a project from a template, you expect that it has the same settings as were in the template. However, even in this case, if you start a project based on a template, for me, one of the first things that I would do would still be check the project setup to see if everything is like I want. Because for a specific project, even if it's based on a template, I might want some slightly different settings. For example, if I receive a stereo file in a certain sample rate and it's not the sample rate that I typically use, I might want to change the sample rate of this mastering project as well. And unless you want to make templates for all the different combinations of these project settings that you ever may want to use, I suggest still checking the project setup before you actually start doing anything with your new project. Fortunately, there's also a way to do that automatically, which is in preferences in Cubase. Edit, preferences, general. You can see that there's a setting over here to run the setup on create new project. If we select that, and let's again create a new project, maybe this time an empty one again, not based on a template. Cubase asks me for my project folder. And then it immediately pops up the project setup dialog so that I can check whether all these settings are correct for the project that I want to start. Now let's have a look at what all these settings mean in the project setup dialog. I'm again back at my original empty project. And by the way, the shortcut to display the project setup is shift S. So let's push shift S. Now the first section over here is called project duration. And this allows you to specify the project start time as well as the project duration. So how long is the project? And this is in timecode format, basically hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. And as you can see, my current project starts at timecode zero. And I've added a special ruler track so that you can easily see the timecode throughout the project, which starts at zero, zero, zero over here. But you could also, for example, let it start at one hour which for some reason is the standard start time of my DaVinci Resolve video editor always. So if I wanted to sync my Cubase project to my DaVinci Resolve project, I could set up the same project start time, push OK, and you can see that my project now starts at time code of one hour, zero minutes, zero seconds, and zero frames. Let's set it back to the standard. Now project duration indicates the length of your project, currently set to five minutes, which will probably fit a standard song quite generously nowadays as songs keep getting shorter. And it's not really an essential setting to make because if your song turns out longer, you can still record in Cubase after five minutes and your project duration will just extend for as long as you record basically. But I like to set this up in a practical way because if you use zoom over here, for example, you can say zoom full, then you can see that Cubase zooms out to 
to the full project duration. So if you've set that up just about correctly, then there's an easy way to get the full project in view. There are other ways as well, by the way, but this is one of them. Now the next option is the project frame rate, which is really only important if you're working with video, either in your Cubase project, or maybe you're making music for a video, then it's nice to have the video frame rate set up correctly. And you can do that with this drop down over here. So there are lots of frame rates that are supported. 24 frames per second and 2398 is more cinematic. 25 is very common for movies as well. 30 frames per second is something that I use a lot because my YouTube videos are 30 frames per second. But you can set this up in any way you like. And if you have a video file inside your project, then you can also click get frame rate from video. And Cubase will get and set the project frame rate from the video. As you can see, I don't have video in there, so it tells me that it's not possible now. But this will work if there's a video in there. Now next up is the section about project time displays. And this time format here basically specifies the default time format that you would like on the rulers in your project. Except for the ruler tracks that you create separately, which you can see over here, because you can set them to a different value. And actually you can do the same for this ruler as well. You can change it. But any new editor that you use in Cubase will start with bars and beats as time format. And that's also the standard that I typically always use. But if you want to change it, you can. For example, if you always work with maybe video dialogue or something that you want to edit, then bars and beats may not be relevant. And you may want to set the default time format to time code. And as you can see, now also the top ruler was changed to timecode and you don't need that separate ruler track anymore. But let's set it back to bars and beats here. Now there's also a time offset here. And the Cubase manual says that this allows you to specify an offset for the time positions in the rulers and position displays to compensate for the project start time setting. So for example, if you have a start time here of one hour, okay. So again, you can see my timecode starts at one hour on bar one. And that may be because you want to synchronize your project to a device which starts with one hour time codes at the beginning. But if you still don't like the fact that now also your rulers start here at one hour, then you can compensate for that by putting one hour in here as well. And now you can see that even though your project starts at one hour and will synchronize to devices which start at one hour, the display still shows zero at the start of your project. Let's return this to default again. And the third option is actually the most useful one, which I typically do not leave to the default value of zero, because this allows you to specify a certain offset at the start of your project. Because right now you can see that my project starts at bar one, but maybe you always want to start the music at bar one as well. And there may be some pickup notes to the music. So you need to insert something before bar one, or you may want to add a count in before bar one, or you may want to export your project slightly before bar one, even if you start exactly on bar one, you do not want to run the risk of cutting off the first note, for example. Or another reason could be that if you're using MIDI tracks, you want to allow some time for initial program MIDI changes to be sent to the device, for example. In any case, there are many reasons why you would not want your project to start exactly at bar one. So that's what you can change over here. For example, if you want to have a two bar count in, you can set this to two, push OK. And now if we zoom out a bit more, you can see that my project actually starts at bar minus one, then bar zero, and then over here, only after two bars do we start at bar one, where you may want to start the actual recording and the music. Now there's another interesting option which I use sometimes, and that's for example, if I have a ruler here set to seconds, and then you can see that this ruler now starts at four seconds where the music actually starts. So if I later make an export of this project for my band to listen to, and they want to comment on the mix, for example, they may want to say like, oh, I hear something here at two minutes, 36 seconds, for example. And unfortunately, because of my two extra bars, this does not line up anymore with the time code, which I have in my project now. But you can change that. For example, you can go to bar one over here, select it and it's exactly at bar one now because I have the grid selected over here and you can now go project set time code at cursor and right now it says well I have four seconds here at this cursor but you can set it to zero like this so you can see that my project now actually starts at a minus value in the time but now I have the situation that when my band member says I hear something at two minutes 36 seconds then I know exactly that it's over here and the time in the mix that I gave to them now actually lines up with the ruler track that I have in my project. 
Now, if you look at the project setup dialog, what actually happens is that Cubase uses a project start time for this. It basically sets it to a negative value so that it compensates for those two bars. Now, before I discuss the other fields in the project setup dialog, if you like this video or find it useful at all, please give it a big thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm so that it gets shown to more people. Subscribe to the channel and ring the little bell icon so you get notified when I publish another video. If you are really enjoying my videos, you can also consider using the super thanks button below the video, which is a virtual tip jar. Or maybe if you want to buy anything at one of these stores, I have affiliate links to the stores in the description below the video. And if you click one of those links before you buy anything over there, I'll get a small commission without any additional cost to you, which is always highly appreciated. But let's get back to the Cubase project setup. And next up in the project setup is the record file format. And this is actually the most important part of this setup that you want to get right from the beginning because it's quite a pain if you have to change this later and it may impact the quality of what you're doing as well. Now it is possible for the sample rate to change this setting later when Cubase will basically then convert all the files that you recorded already. And I have a separate video about that in the description below, but better get this right from the start. And the first thing to get right is the sample rate, which specifies in this case that Cubase records and plays back 48,000 samples of the audio in each second. And there's definitely a lot of discussion about what the best sample rate is. As you can see over here, you can go much higher depending on your audio interface, because if you select the sample rate, which is not supported by your audio interface, it will be shown with a yellow exclamation mark indicating that this will not work and you need to select a different one. But this interface that I'm using from RME actually supports up to 192,000 samples per second, which is very high, arguably provides better quality. However, the strain on your CPU is also four times as high as with the 48 kilohertz sample rate, which also seems to be the sample rate that is most used in the industry. Also suitable for video, Dolby Atmos. So that's the one that I have always settled on. Arguably slightly better than the default 44.1 kilohertz, which is the sample rate of standard CDs. If you guys still know what CDs are actually, but I typically use 48 kilohertz and that has always served me well. Now the bit depth specifies how many bits are recorded for every sample, partly also determined by your hardware, but it's also a project setting that you can set higher than what your hardware supports. For example, you could also set this to 32 bit float, which means that Cubase will always store recorded audio files with 32 bit float numbers instead of only 24 bits which typically provides you with almost an unlimited dynamic range. And this can be important, for example, if you bounce down files with effects on there, then the dynamic range of those effects matters, but your audio interface will likely not support 32-bit float recording. So then you're not really gaining anything there. You also have to remember that if you select a higher number over here, this will also increase the storage space on your hard drive, like the sample rate did as well, actually. There are just more samples and bigger samples to store on your hard drive. So every minute of recorded audio will yield a bigger file size. I have to say that I usually choose 24 bit for my record and mix projects. I may go 32 bit float if I receive a file in that format, which for example needs to be mastered, then that mastering project will be 32 bit float, but I'm not really doing a lot of mastering anyway. So for me, the standard is definitely 24 bit 48K. Now the last option allows you to select the file type that you want to use. I typically use WAV files. AIFF files is more the standard on the Mac. FLAC is a compressed audio format, which is lossless. I've never tried it. It will probably give smaller files, but you will lose a little bit of processing when decoding and encoding those FLAC files. So I typically use WAV files over here. Broadcast WAV is another standard, which is for example used for Dolby Atmos when you export a Dolby Atmos mix. And broadcast wave also allows you to insert some extra information, which you can see over here, record audio broadcast wave. Then there's some extra metadata, which is added into the files. But I have to say, I've never had the need to use this myself. Let me know if you have used it and for what exactly, then we can all learn from each other as well. Now, next up is a project ownership information over here. As you can see, I've set up my name and my company name, which has the benefit of showing over here in the title bar, whose project I have currently loaded. So if it's a project from another studio, I would also see that over there, which is quite handy. And another thing that you can do is when you export an audio file and you specify insert IXML chunk over here, then your name and company name will actually be part of the exported audio file as well. Now, if you want to make sure that in the project setup, this is always filled out, then you can also specify it in the preferences as a default, general personalization, and then it will automatically be included in the project setup as well. 
Now next up is the stereo pan law which you can set over here. And this has to do with the fact that when you pan a sound in Cubase or any other DAW for that matter, if you don't set up a pan law, then the sound will decrease in volume loudness when you're panning a sound. So if you go to the middle, the sound will be louder. And if you go to the sides, you will notice that the sound will decrease in loudness. Let's have a look at that. If we, for example, set this up to zero dB, and if I now play the serum patch here and I pan from left to right, you will notice that the volume will decrease. If I go to the sides, it will increase when I move to the center. Yeah, so even though technically we're not actually reducing any volume on this patch, we perceive it as being softer and louder. And to avoid that, you can set up a pan law which basically means that the centered sound will be decreased in volume by a certain amount. And when you pan the sound left or right, it will not be decreased in volume. So let's set that up. For example, set it up as minus 3 dB, which basically means that the centered sound will be decreased in volume by 3 dB. And when you go left and right, there will be no decrease in volume. And you'll perceive this as the loudness, the volume of the sound staying the same despite panning. Now there's an even better variant of this, which is called equal power. And this means that there's a certain curve when you go from center to the sides so that you notice it even less. Probably not distinguishable from the previous one, but let's listen. Okay, let me know if you can hear the difference with minus three dB. For me, it's very similar. Now there are some other options here. But I basically always use equal power, which is also the default in Cubase. Now the volume over here basically determines the maximum level of any faders that you have in Cubase. By default, it's set to plus 6 dB. And then if we open the mixer, you can see that these faders over here, they top out at plus 6 dB. If you now change the volume max over here, then you can see the faders now top out at plus 12 dB. I typically leave it set to the default of plus 6 dB, but if you want to be able to boost a little bit more volume on a channel, you can set it to plus 12 dB. Just make sure you do this at the beginning of your project before you start using any automation, for example, because this will also impact your automation. Now, next up is the so-called her mode tuning. And this is about the fact that some people don't actually like our equal tempered tuning, which is what we typically use on most instruments. Because if you play multiple notes at the same time, the overtones on those notes can produce some clashing, which causes the so-called beating, which is also what you hear when you try to tune a guitar and two strings are not exactly in tune. Then you hear a bit of wavering of the pitch. And that same effect you can also get in the standard tuning when you play certain intervals on certain chords due to the overtones that they produce. Now, like I said, this is a very specialized subject. If you're into classical music or jazz, maybe check it out, do a Google. I'll also include a link to a Cubase forum thread, which discusses and actually shows you some of the differences, lets you listen to them. It's interesting, but I've never actually used it myself. And then for the last project setting here, which is a project location. And as you can see, it just shows where your project file is located on your hard disk. And you can even show that in the Explorer. And as you can see, it opens the Windows Explorer in my case with the project file highlighted, which I have in there. And those are the project setup settings in Cubase, which I feel you should check at the start of every project. So let me know if you do this as well, if you have certain preferences for these settings or certain use cases that might be worthwhile for others to know about. Put it in the comments so we can all learn from each other. Now in this video, I showed the Cubase hub a couple of times already, which is a central user interface in Cubase that allows you to create and open projects and do quite a bit more actually. And I made a separate video about that already, which I will link over here. Check it out, enjoy, and see you soon. Mm -hmm.